Chapter 9, Odd Number Problems 17 through 23. Number 17, Ackerman and Goldsmith found that students who studied text print from printed hard copy had better test scores than students who studied from text presented on a screen. In a related study, a professor noticed that several students in a large class had purchased the ebook version of the course textbook. For the final exam, the overall average for the entire class was 81.7. But the sample of nine students who used the ebook had a mean of 77.2 with a standard deviation equal to 5.7. Is the sample sufficient to conclude that the scores for students using ebooks were significantly different from scores for the regular class? Use a two tailed test with alpha equal to 0.05. So we'll begin with our known in research hypothesis. So Noah will state that the final exam scores will not differ between those who use the print text versus ebook. And the notation would be the average exam final exam score for the ebook users would equal that of the print book users, which was 81.7. The research hypothesis is going to say, begin, given the fact that we're conducting a two-tailed test, would be that the final exam scores will differ. Now we could obviously be a little um, more extensive in our um, wording, but I'm just going to keep it short here. Final exam scores will differ, and our exam score average for those using the ebook will not equal 81.7. And again, we're going to conduct a t test um, for significance. To do so, we're going to need to find our critical t that's dependent upon our, our degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1 degrees of freedom for this example. Our sample size um, is equal to 9. 9 minus 1 gives us, oops, excuse me, <laughs> did the, the solution before I got there. 9 minus 1 gives us 8. So we're going to find our critical t value using our t distribution. Okay, so our degrees of freedom were equal to 8. We had a two-tailed test parameter, and we had alpha set at 0.05. Those were all given. So two-tailed tier here, 0 0.05, 8 um, as degrees of freedom. And it went up a little bit. Um, so where they meet is here at 2.5. 306. So that's our critical T value. So we just identified that our critical T is positive negative 2.306. Uh, let's draw this out. So we have our parameters of negative 2.306, positive 2.306. We're going to determine if the sample mean of 77.2 is significantly different from mean <clears throat> of 81.7. And to do so, we got to calculate our t statistic. We are going to calculate by taking our sample mean minus the population mean divided by our estimated standard error. To calculate our standard error, we we have our um, mm -hmm. Our sample standard deviation, which is 5.7. 5.7 defined by, let me write up my equation first, just so that we stay consistent with seeing the process. 
So it uh, would be our sample standard deviation over the square root of n. That would equal 5.7 over the square root of 9. So in our calculators, we're going to enter 5.7. 0.7 divided by the square root of 9, and we get 0 0.63, I believe. Let me do that one more time. In my second calculation, if I do that correctly, 5.7 divided by the square root of 9. I forgot to do the square root of 9, and I get point, excuse me, 1.9. So we should all get 1.9. And now, if I want to calculate my t-statistic, take our sample mean of 77.2 minus our population mean of 81.7, now divided by our estimated standard error of 1.9. So in our calculators, we take 77.2 minus 81.7. 7 divided by our estimated standard error of 1.9, and we get negative, negative 2.368, or we could round to 2.2.37. Um, if we stay three digits since our critical t is three, this would be the more appropriate value to, to use. So we'll just stick with that. And given that value, we'll come over here and, and um, see where it resides in relation to our critical t. And um, it is in the, in our critical region in the blue. And in this case, our value is in the critical region, just slightly above. And so we are happy in the sense that we pass the test um, and we get to, at this point, reject the null. Also, rejecting the null, we know, um, indicates that our probability statement is going to look like this, that the probability of obtaining that t statistic is less than our alpha of 0.05. It's good to uh, write those things down before we, you draw your final conclusions. The next step is um, to calculate our confidence interval and then our concluding statement. So let's move on to that. Okay, so we're going to calculate our confidence interval at 90, 90%. So our equation is mu is equal to um, the sample mean plus or minus t multiplied by our estimated standard error. The things that we know, we know our sample mean is equal to 77.2. We're going to find t in our um, in our t distribution, so we'll find that in a second. And our estimated standard error does not change; it's 1.9. And again, the process of finding that t value. Don't make the mistake of reporting our t statistic. That's not the same. We're going to calculate m here and m here based on the <clears throat> sample mean that is a good representation of the population mean. In other words, if all individuals um, use the ebook version of the text, they would the population would have an average final exam score of 77.2. So we want to estimate what the entire population would, student population would um, average on their final exam if they all use the ebook in, in, instead of the print version. So we're going to calculate the um, range of values. In the center, we have 90% of the values. So that leaves us a 10% um, distributed across the two tails. So we're going to convert that 10% into a proportion. And we're going to use degrees of freedom, which were equal to 8. And <clears throat> we're going to use that information to figure out what t is equal to. So let's turn our attention to our t distribution. Okay, so like um, we just indicated, we're looking for 90% in the middle, meaning we have 10% in the tails. 
So it's a two-tailed process when we're calculating the confidence interval. So we look for point 0.1 there. Our deg degrees of freedom for this problem are equal to 8. So we're going to see where those two things intersect, and it gives us a t equal to 1.860. So that's the value we're going to use in our calculation. Okay, so we've determined that our t is equal to 1.860. And I'm just going to rewrite that because that's a little hard to see. 1.860 multiplied by our estimated standard error of 1.9. So again, we're calculating two values, one here below this um, sample mean and one above the sample mean. So we take our um, calculators and we'll do the um, value on the high end first, so 1.860 multiplied by 1.9 added to 77.2, and we should get a value of 80.734. Again, this is all based on the center of 77.2. And on the low end, um, on our calculators, if we take um, 1.860 negative multiplied by 1.9 added to 77.2, we should get 77, 77, excuse me, 73.666. Again, we've just calculate, calculated the range of um, final exam scores that would occur 90% of the time if all students use an ebook version of um, the text for the final exam. So, again, this is we're 90% confident that the final exam scores would fall within this range if everyone used the ebook version of the textbook. Obviously, it um, is lower than the achievement um, of those who didn't use the ebook. So um, what we're concluding here is that we wouldn't want the students overall to use the ebook, but it's a significant uh, finding showing that we do see significant differences and it, it's not in the direction that we would um, hope for. Um, and showing this range is even within that range, it's not um, including the average of those using the print book. All right, so we've calculated our confidence interval, and now what we're going to do is write our concluding statement. I want to throw in one more step um, before we write our concluding statement, and that's to calculate D, just because a lot of the examples don't ask us to do this. Um, so I'm going to calculate our D statistic, which is our sample mean minus our population mean, or our effect size, divided by S. Um, so D would equal 77.2 minus 81.7 divided by our standard deviation, which was our sample standard deviation, which is 5.7. And if we do that calculation, so 77.2 minus 81.7 divided by 5.7, we get negative, and we'll just round two digits right of the dec decimal, negative 0.79. And this is a good point. Um, to clarify that the calculation um, mathematically is negative, but when we report our D, we actually always report it as a positive. And the reason is that our D um, represents the mean difference in standard deviation units. Standard deviation units are always um, an average, um, average difference between the sample mean and the population mean. And standard deviation is the average of squared deviation, so it must always be reported. The final representation is always a positive number. Mathematically, here we're showing it as a negative, and that's just showing that the sample mean is below the population mean. 
Um, so mathematically speaking, it, it will be perhaps a negative, but your final re representation will be reported as a positive. And this is actually a very high, high effect based on our table. All right, now we can write our concluding statement. So uh, we know that we are going to reject, reject the null. Again, our T statistic um, in the previous example or um, part of this question allowed us to reject the null. Um, it was large enough to put us into the critical region. So we're going to conclude that the exam scores for those who used the ebook were significantly different. And we um, indicate what kind of tests we conducted. We conducted a t-test. Um, the degrees of freedom were equal to 8. And our t-statistic was equal to negative 2.368. Our probability statement indicated that the probability of obtaining that t-value is less than our alpha, which is good, which means we got to reject the null. And then we would follow with our um, supporting statistics. D is equal to 0.79. And then we calculated a confidence interval at 90%. So we're 90% confident that if the entire student population were to use an ebook version of the tax, their final exam results would reside within the range of 73.666 through 80.734. Again, this prediction is of the unknown population. And that is our concluding statement for this particular example. I'm actually going to include one more supporting statistic and erase all of this um, simply because not all of the um, upcoming examples include um, R squared. And I want to give you as much um, uh, modeling of all of this supporting statistics from this chapter. So in this chapter, we learned about R squared from our reading. And what R squared represents is the percentage of variance or difference explained by the treatment effect. So we can, uh, once we do that calculation, we would ex express it as the, the percentage of change as a result of treatment. So let me demonstrate this. Um, the equation is R squared is equal to T squared, and this T is our T statistic. This is our T statistic, unlike when we co calculate our conf confidence interval, that T was different. This is from our T calculation, um, and our equation is as follows. So R squared is equal to our T statistic squared over our T statistic squared added to our degrees of freedom. So for this example, um, let's replace our variables. Our R squared is equal to negative 2.368 squared over negative 2.368, and we're going to square that, added to our degrees of freedom, which is equal to 8. Um, and if we look at around, these numbers get quite long um, on our calculator display, and, and uh, we can estimate. Um, so I'm just going to round three digits to write the decimal. If we square the numerator, um, we'll get 5.5. 607 in our calculators. Um, and then for the denominator, if we square this again, we get the same answer, plus 8, and that would give us 13.607. Now this quotient, so 5.607, our calculators divided by 
to 5.607 divided by 13.607 is equal to 0 0.4120673, but we'll just uh, cut it off at um, 0.41. All right, so this is our new statistic, and it's referred to as R squared. Again, it's the percentage of variance or change that's explained by the treatment. In other words, in this particular context, we can say that the percentage, 41% of the change in exam scores is as a result of the different type of textbook that the students are using. I'll say that again. 41% of the change in exam scores, again, we saw a change in exam score results from 81.7 to 77.2. And 41% of that change is due to the fact that they're using different types of text. One group is using the traditional print text, and the other group is using the ebook. Um, in Table 9.3, we have a similar um, display of effect size, um, and there it says R squared equal to 0 0.01 is considered small. Um, R squared equal to 0 0.09 medium, and R squared equal to 0.25 is considered large. So anything above, so if we were to say 25% of the change in scores um, resulting from treatment is considered a large effect. Um, and then obviously anything less than that considered either medium or small. So in this case, we would say, again, this would be a very large effect. That the difference in scores, and in, in this case, a, a significant decrease in scores, is due to the fact that these students are using the ebook versus the print. So, again, 41% of the change in test scores is as a result in the use of the ebook. So we can attribute this change in scores to the use of the ebook, or we can attribute the change or decrease in exam scores to the ebook. Now, this R square would be um, normally included in our conclusions um, instead of D, so right here. So you would never um, see both, it would be one or the other. Again, I just wanted to include that as an additional. Um, illustration of a supporting statistic, um, and this is a really great illustration because it's kind of easy to understand. 41% of the change in scores from 81.7 to 77.2 is due to the fact that these students who scored, um, they didn't score as well as, or is due to the fact that they're using the ebook. All right, number 19, here we have um, some statistics to help us calculate R squared and Cohen's D, um, but they're absent of a context of variables, so that is the reason why in the previous example I wanted to calculate D and R so we can see how they're explained. All right, here we have a random sample is obtained from a population with a mean equal to 45. After treatment is, is administered to the individual's in the sample, the sample mean is equal to 49 with a standard deviation equal to 12. Assuming that the sample consists of nine scores, compute R squared and estimate and the estimated Cohen's D to measure the size of um, treatment effect. So we're going to calculate, um, we're going to need our T statistic to calculate R squared and um, we're going to calculate our estimated D. So let's begin with um, calculating our estimated D. Estimated D, again, it's estimated because we're using sample statistic or sample standard deviation. Chapter 8, we actually had population standard deviation. Here we're using S. So M minus mu over S 
Um, we have our sample mean of 49, 49 minus 45, divided by our sample standard deviation of 12. So in our calculators, 49 minus 45 divided by 12, we get 0.33. All right, um, for R squared, R squared, our equation is our T statistic <clears throat> squared over our T statistic squared added to our degrees of freedom. We need to calculate our T. Our T is equal to our mean difference over our estimated standard error. And we're going to need standard error, estimated standard error, which is equal to um, S over our sample standard deviation over the square root of n. So this would equal 12 over the square root of 9. So 12 over 3 gives us 4. All right, so now we can calculate our t value. So 49 minus 45 divided by 4. So 49 minus 45 is actually 4 divided by 4, and we get 1. And then, now we can calculate R squared. So our T squared would be 1 squared, and 1 squared. And our degrees of freedom are equal to N minus 1, so 9 minus 1 is 8. So then we would get 1. And then 1 plus 8 is 9. So now we do the calculation of 1 over 9. Whoops. 1 over 9 gives us 0.11. And to interpret this, again, it's important not only to do the calculations accurately, but to be able to explain this. So here, what this statistic tells us is that um, the difference difference between M and mu is equal to 0.33 standard deviation units. Again, we've learned that it takes us, you know, one standard deviation unit in normal distribution to be distinguished as something other than common. So this would be considered, um, you know, a, a low effect. So we would consider this low, low effect. And uh, again, just expressing what is it that D represents? It's, it's expressing the mean difference in standard deviation units. Well, what does R square represent? R square is the percentage of difference, right, um, um, in the values based on treatment effect. So again, um, what we're saying here, we take that proportion 0.1 and we would say 11% of the difference in scores is explained by the treatment. So 11% of the difference, um, or the 11 percent of the difference in the scores, more precisely, is explained by the treatment. Again, we take that proportion and convert it into a percentage. And according to our um, table, we would consider that as a medium effect, medium effect based on our table in chapter, chapter 9. Okay, so that was just a simple exercise of, of doing these calculations, but also I want to point out that we need to understand what these concepts represent. Continuing with the same example, now we're asked to um, compute these um, same statistics, but now we've changed the sample size. So we went from a sample size of 9 to 16, and we want to see if there is any effect on our 
um, values of r squared and d. So let's compute d. So d is equal to um, sample mean minus mu, the effect size, or the mean um, actual treatment difference or effect over s, and we get 45 minus. 49, oops, 49, it should be 49, sorry about that, 49 minus 45 over S, which is 12, we should see something um, pretty interesting, again, um, no effect, there was no difference, um, the point being here that if we um, calculate D, given a change in n, we won't see any difference. Again, this is why we use d. Um, if you recall from the last chapter, Cohen decided that um, there was too much of an effect of sample size on our concluding statements when we determine significance. And so this supporting statistic helps us eliminate the effects of sample size um, when we're drawing a conclusion. So. As we would expect, no, no difference um, in our calculations when we calculate Cohen's D after increasing sample to um, 16. Now, if we were calculating the T value itself, we would expect some difference, but that's not what we're calculating here. All right, so now we're going to calculate R squared. Now, R squared is a function of our T statistics, so we should expect um, some effect, but not necessarily too large of an, uh, of an effect, and we'll see that here. All right, so we need to calculate our t value. Um, so again, our t is equal to our treatment effect, the mean difference, over our estimated standard error, and that's equal to, standard error is equal to s, um, stand, standard deviation of our sample over square root of our sample size, and that in this case is equal to 12 over the square root of 16. And this is where we'll see a difference because n did change. So now we have 12 over the square root of 16, which is 4. Um, 12 divided by 4 gives us 3. And now we can calculate our t. So we have 49 minus 45 divided by 3. I believe in the last example we did divide by 4, so 49 minus 45 divided by 3, and we get 1.33. So now we can calculate our R squared, so that would be 1.33 squared over 1.33 squared plus or degrees of freedom, which in this case would now equal 15, so a slight difference there. And this would equal, so 1.33 squared, okay, we're just going to round 1.77 and 1.77 plus 15, one, so 16.769, our calculator is more or less, um, and then 1.77 divided by 16.769. So let's do that. 1.77 divided by 16.769. We should get 0 0.106 if we round. And now what we want to do is compare that to what we got in our last example. So in the last example, we got a... Um, R squared, so in our last example, our D was identical. D was equal to 0.33. Again, no surprise because N was not a function. Uh, D is not a function of N. And then our R squared for our last example when N was equal to 9 was equal to 0 0.111. And see how similar this is here, identical and then very similar. 
So our last um, item here says comparing our answers from part A and B. How does the number of scores in the sample influence measures of effect size? Measures of effect size are really uh, aiding us in, in minimizing the um, influences of N. So when it comes to D, um, calculating D, is not affected. by sample size, r squared is minimally affected. And that's what we would hope for because the function or purpose of these effect size measurements is to um, negate the influences of sample size that we want to encourage researchers to use very large sample sizes. We want to um, emphasize the treatment effect. Um, and to do so, we want to support the concluding statements with these statistics that really show um, and focus on the difference between sample size and population um, averages not population size, excuse me, population size, excuse me, it's population average and sample average. That's what's important. The sample average and population average. This is what is of interest to us. And um, when we calculate things like D and R squared, sample size is not influencing the effect um, of the difference between these two things. Number 21, in studies examining the effect of humor on interpersonal attraction, researchers found that individual sense of humor had a significant effect on how the individual was perceived by others. In one part of the study, female college students were given brief dis descriptions of a potential romantic partner. The fictitious male was described positively as being single, ambitious, and having good pro job prospects. For one group of participants, the description also said that he had a great sense of humor. For another group, it said that he had no sense of humor. After reading the description, each participant was asked to rate the attractiveness of the man on a seven-point scale from one very attractive to seven very unattractive. A score of four indicates a neutral rating. Um, it should be clarified, I believe uh, this is a, a typo in the text where um, very attractive would actually be the higher value of 7. So this, this um, here very attractive should be a 7 and this should be a 1 unattractive. The higher the score, the more attractive um, the individual. Nonetheless, um, we can proceed with the um, statistics given here. A says, the females who read the, um, the great sense of humor description gave the potential partner an average attractiveness score of 4.53 with a standard deviation of 1.04. If the sample consisted of uh, n equal to 16 participants, is the average rating significantly higher the neutral. Neutral is equal to 4. Use a one-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so again, now that we've clarified that typo from the text, um, someone that's rated closer to 7 is perceived as being more attractive. Again, that would clarify that if we anticipate them to be rated as higher than neutral, um, that would make sense. And I'm just going to move some of this text out of the way so I have a little bit more room. Okay, so this is what I need. I'm going to start with my research in null hypothesis. Again, this is a one-tailed test. Um, normally, I find it easier to begin with the research hypothesis um, because that's the interest. Um, that's what we're um, focusing on. So I'm going to begin there. The attractiveness rating. of males d 
described as having a great sense of humor will be rated higher and higher the directional test than neutral. The notation, the mu will be greater. Neutral is defined as four. So the null would state, again, it's always in the opposite direction and equal to. So the attractiveness rating of males described as having a great sense of humor will be rated less than or equal to a neutral whoops rating so the mu the average rating for those described as having a great sense of humor will be less than or equal to the neutral rating of four all right so we're going to conduct our hypothesis test using alpha at five percent and a um, one tail test because again we've identified direction we need to identify our critical t that's going to be contingent upon our degrees of freedom degrees of freedom are equal to n minus 1. In this case, um, degrees of freedom will equal 16 minus 1, which is equal to 15. So we're going to find our critical t and our t distribution. So we're using a one-tailed test at 5%. Um, d was equal to 15. So we're going to See where those things intersect, those two columns intersect, and we get 1.5, excuse 1.753. Critical T is equal to positive negative 1.753 according to our table. Um, I'm going to hold off on drawing my distribution um, because I'm short on space here, so I'm going to do my calculations first. So my t statistic is equal to m minus mu divided by my estimated standard error. Standard error is equal to um, my standard deviation over the square root of m, and that's equal to 1.04 over the square root of 16. So in our calculators, if we take 1.04 divided by the 16, the square root of 16, 1.04 divided by the square root of 16, we get 0.26. Let me do that one more time just to confirm. Hopefully you got the same thing. 1.0. So 0.26. Now we can calculate our t. So we have our sample mean of 4.53. And our estimated standard error of 0.26. So in our calculators, 
0.53 minus 4 divided by 0.26, and we get 2.038. Okay, so now we can um, compare that to our critical T. Critical T was set at 1.53, and I just noticed a slight mistake up here, uh, and I'm hesitant to erase it because I might make a mess, but um, it shouldn't be positive and negative because we were simply doing a one-tailed test, so it was just the positive version. Had I done my table, I would have recognized that. Um, so again, we're only doing a one-tailed test, so we're only focusing on one side of the distribution. So this t value, right, um, we consider where it resides in our distribution in relation to the critical t, and if it falls in the critical region, and indeed it does. So we know at this point we are going to reject the null. And in addition to um, that, we, we are also going to calculate some um, other statistics, which include Cohen's D, and um, I'm going to do R squared and a confidence interval. None of those things are required in this particular question, but I want to do that for um, just modeling purposes. So I'm going to raise some of this information to give me the ample space to illustrate Cohen's d, r squared, and a confidence interval. All right, so let's just restate what our t value was equal to. We came up with the t equal to t equal to 2.04 if I remember correctly 2.04 which enabled us to reject the null hypothesis and now what I want to do is calculate D estimated D as a supporting statistic so D is equal to m minus mu divided by standard deviation, so we have 4.53 minus 4 divided by our standard deviation of 1.04, so in our calculators, 4.53 minus 4 divided by 1.04, so 4.53 minus 4 divided by 1.04, and we get point we round to the right of the decimal 0.51, which is considered medium of fact. And then we'll calculate r squared. r squared is equal to t squared, and again that's our t statistic, so 2.04 squared, 2.04 squared plus our degrees of freedom in this case would equal 15, 15. So 2.04 squared, again I'm going to be rounding, 4.16, so 4.16 plus 15 gives us 19.16, and 4.16 divided by 19.16 in our calculators, so together we should get 0 0.217, 0 0.2, if we round, 0.22. And this is also considered, um, this is actually medium effect, this is medium to high effect. And again, what this is telling us, that the Cohen's D is saying that the difference between 4.53 and 4 is, the, is equivalent to half a standard deviation unit. And then R squared is saying that 22% of the difference in attractiveness ratings is due to the fact that um, those individuals who scored higher 
were described as having a great sense of humor. So 22% of the difference in ratings, attractiveness ratings, is due to the fact that um, some were described as having a great sense of humor. And then finally, let's do a confidence interval um, at 90%, so 90% confidence interval. So we're going to calculate our range of values, oops, plus or minus our T, again that's not our T statistic, it's our T from our um, T distribution. So we know that M is equal to 4.53, plus we're going to find our T value and our T distribution multiplied by our standard error, and we had calculated that previously um, in the first part of this problem, and that was actually equal to 0.2626, so you should have that written down, 0.26. Um, again, what we're doing is um, taking into consideration 90% of the time what the what the rating, the attractiveness rating would be for the men that are um, described as having a great sense of humor. So uh, we're going to take into consideration that 4.53 is a good estimate of how they would be rated, but now we're going to get calculate a range of um, what the values would be 90% of the time. So we're going to use um, 0.1, proportion 0.1, and the two-tailed tier to find out what t is equal to in our t distribution. Okay, so again we're using 15 as our degrees of freedom two-tailed tier, because it's a process of calculating the confidence interval. There are two tails to consider. So 90% in the middle leaves us 10% in the tails. So we're going to see where those two values intersect, and there's an interesting point to make here. Um, so it's 1.753. Now someone may ask, why is that the same as our critical T? The reason being is that we conducted a one-tailed test at 5%. So if you look up here, one tailed at 5%, everything else um, was the same, and degrees of freedom was 15. So that's why the critical T for that example, that hypothesis test at one tailed at alpha at 5%, was the same if we're going to conduct a confidence interval at 90%. So don't be confused. Um, that's by coincidence that here we're doing a 90% confidence interval, gives us the same T value. So now we have our T of 1.753, so we're going to calculate um, the range of expected value, uh, attractiveness rating values if all men were described as having a great sense of humor. On the high end, so in our, ca in our calculators, if we take 0.26, so 0.26 multiplied by 1.753. 753 added to 5, excuse me, 4.53, we get um, on the high end, and I'm just going to carry this over here, 4.986, we round, and then on the low end, um, 1.753 negative times 0.26 plus 4.53. And we get 4.074. So what we've just calculated is that if all men were described as having a great sense of humor, we would rank them as having an attractiveness rating of anywhere from 4.07 to 4.98. Again, all else, all else being held constant, um, taking those other variables into consideration. All right, so these are all our supporting statistics, and I wanted to do that just to give you, again, yet another model of from beginning to end, the hypothesis test with all its um, additional supporting statistics. The Collins D represents the effect size expressed in standard deviation units, the movement, um, the difference in scores the effect size represented as percentage of change due to treatment. In this case, 
22% of the change in attractiveness ratings due to um, those being described as having a great sense of humor. And then finally, 90% of the time, um, we're 90% we're 90 confident that if we describe all men as having great as having a great sense of humor, their attractiveness rating would range between 4.07 and 4.98. All right, that leads us to our final um, point of our concluding statement. So I'm going to pause and write that statement after I erase all of this uh, information. Okay, so based on our T statistic, we got to reject, reject the null. The null stated that the ratings would be less than or equal to 4. We, we found that they were actually greater than 4, so we reject the null. Uh, results indicate that um, males, so results... Males that were described as having a great of humor. were rated as more attractive we could actually say significantly more attractive we conducted a t-test with degrees of freedom equal to 15 our T statistic was equal to 2.04. Our probability statement, the probability of obtaining a T value of 2.04 was less than our alpha of 0.05. We conducted a one-tailed one -tailed test. Our D was equal to 0 0.51, 0 0.51, which was the medium effect. R squared was equal to 0. 2.2 if we round, 0.22, which con was considered high, 22% of the difference in ratings is due to that characteristic of having a great sense of humor. And our 90% confidence interval states that if all men were described as having a, hot, as a, a great sense of humor, they would be rated as having an attractiveness score, 4.074 through 4.986. Again, not all of this was required for this example, but I think it's useful to see something in context um, and share all of these statistics being calculated. Um, important note to make is that um, you wouldn't see all these supported statistics in one um, research conclusion. Most researchers pick one as a support to their concluding statement. Okay, so continue with this same theme. Um, now we're looking at females who read a description as men having no sense of humor. So we're going to see what the effect is on the rating. So the females who read the script description saying no sense of humor gave the potential partner an average attractiveness of 3.3 um, with a standard deviation of 1.18. With a sample consisted, consisted of 16 participants, is the average rating significantly lower, lower than the neutral of 4? Use a one-tailed test at 0 0.05. Degrees of freedom, um, still equal to 15. We're using 16 individuals. The critical T hasn't changed. I'm not going to look that up again because we're still using a one-tailed test. Degrees of freedom of 15 and alpha is 0 0.05. So using what we um, had in our previous example, it's still 1.753. However, what is different is it's the negative version simply because now we're looking at less than um, the lower rating. 
So our null and our research hypothesis would be stated as such. So the research would say that um, the females um, will rate, or so females rate males described as having no sense of humor as less attractive. And the notation would be the average rating would be less than the neutral rating of four. And the research type, uh, the null would state that females rate males described as having no sense of humor equally or more attractive than a rating of neutral. So mu would be greater or equal to 4. All right, so we're going to conduct our t-test. We need to um, calculate our t-statistic, m minus mu divided by estimated standard error. Estimated standard error is equal to s over square root of n. Our sample standard deviation is equal to 1.18 over the square root of 16. So in our calculator is 1.18 divided by the square root of 16 and we get 0.295. So this then becomes 3.30, our sample average, minus which is the neutral rating, two, um, divided by 0.295. So 3.3 minus 4 divided by 0.295, and we get a negative 2.373. And again, given the parameters of our test, we focus on one tail, negative 1.753, um, our critical region is here in the tail. This critical, or T statistic falls into that region, and so we know we get to reject the null. The null said that they would be rated as higher than neutral or equal to. Here we've concluded that they're actually rated less than neutral, um, and we would reject the null hypothesis. This is all I'm going to do for this one, since in the previous one I went through all the extensive steps of supporting um, um, statistics. So we're just going to reject the null, and again we conclude that the females actually do rate males as less attractive when they are described as having no sense of humor. The last example showed that women, um, females tend to rate males as more attractive when they are described as having a great sense of humor. So something to take note of, um, males who are listening. On to the next example. All right, 23, we're in for the long haul with this one. Research examining the effects of preschool child care has found that children who spend time in daycare, especially high quality daycare, perform better on math and language tests than children who stay home with their mothers. In a typical study, a research obtains a sample of 10 children who attended daycare 
before starting school. The children are given a standardized test, math test, for which the population mean is equal to 50. The scores for the sample are as follows. Is the sample sufficient to conclude that the children with a history of preschool daycare are significantly different from the general population? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.01. All right, so notice here we're given the raw score data, so we actually have to calculate the standard deviation for a sample. So we need to re remember how to do that. So first we need to calculate what the sample average is and then the standard deviation for this particular distribution of scores. So my scores are 53, 57, 61, 56, and I'm just going to make sure I have all of the scores. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and was equal to 10. I'm going to take the sum of all my scores. So in our calculators, go ahead and take the summation of this um, these scores to calculate the mean. The mean is equal to the sum of x over n. We know n is equal to 10, so by now you should have the sum is equal to 555. So 555 divided by 10 gives us an average score on this math test of 55.5. Again, the mu um, was equal to 50, so the mu was equal to 50. And now we have a sample average equal to 55.5 using the data given. We've been able to calculate that. Now we need to calculate our standard deviation. To do so, we're going to need to calculate the sum of squared deviations, the sum of x squared minus the sum of x squared over n. What do we already know? We know the sum of x. We just calculated that in our, cal in our mean calculation, and that was equal to 555. We're going to square that value. n is equal to 10, and what we don't know is our sum of x squared. So this is a little involved, but um, in our calculators we're going to square all of these values. So 55, 53 squared, and I'm just going to go through this quite quickly um, because it is a bit time consuming. All I'm doing is taking all my x values and squaring them. In fact, what I'm going to do is pause and continue with this so you don't have to watch all of this. Okay, so I've done all these calculations, and, and I should um, let you know that I had written 55 over here on the left, 51 twice, and it should have been 56. So, um, again, the summation of x is equal to 555. And you'll want to check that again based on these numbers here. And um, I've squared all of these values. You want to check that work to make sure. You can pause the video and affirm that you understand where that um, these numbers are coming from. And here I've taken the summation of all scores that have been squared, which is this variable that was missing from our equation. So I'm going to enter it here, so 30,965. And now I have everything I need to calculate my sum of squared deviations. So in our calculators, we would square 555, divide it by 10, and subtract it from 30,965. And we should get a sum of squared deviations equal to 162.5. From there, we can calculate our variance. Variance is equal to SS over N minus 1 ss over df and so our ss is equal to 162.5 over n minus 1 which in this case would equal 9 so our variance is equal to 162.5 divided by 9 and we should get 18.06 and all of that simply to calculate this statistic which will enable us to calculate the estimated standard error this is, again, from beginning to end, taking all of the things that we've learned um, that include concepts from chapters 3 and 4, 
and and in addition um, things from five six seven eight and nine um, understanding the um, process and applying um, a hypothesis test using descriptive and inferential statistics so at this point it's all descriptive statistics and we're going to engage in the inferential statistics um, by conducting our hypothesis test so I'm going to erase all of this so then now we can calculate our um, t statistic and set the parameters of our um, of our test using a, a two-tailed hypothesis with alpha equal to 0 0.01 Okay, so our degrees of freedom, our degrees of freedom are equal to n minus 1. Degrees of freedom for this case are equal to 10 minus 1 is equal to 9. Um, we're conducting a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.01, so we need to find our critical t. Okay, so our degrees of freedom are equal to 1, excuse me, 9 our two-tailed test at alpha 0 0.01 so we'll see where those things intersect come down this way we get 3.250 as our critical t so our critical t is equal to 3.250 plus or minus given a two-tailed test um, let's not neglect to actually state our research and null hypothesis so again we're looking at the um, effects of going to preschool on math capabilities. So the research, the null says that um, math test results, so math results will not differ for children with child care oops, the child care history or history of child care so the mu will equal to 50 and the research hypothesis will say that math results will differ. The mu will not equal 50. So the those with the child care history or history of child care, those who went to child care will have different math results. So just to um, state um, the hypothesis, the parameters are set given our alpha. Um, we've set a pretty high t value because our sample size is quite low. So we have 3.25 negative um, and a positive 3.25. And now we're going to calculate our t statistic. Um, we calculated just a minute ago what our variance was equal to. Our variance was equal to 18.06. And now we can use that to calculate our standard estimated standard error, which is equal to the square root of 18.06 over n. Um, n in this case is equal to 10. So let me just write the equation. I don't want to lose you. Um, so it's the variance over n. I'm going to take the square root of all of that. And this is equal to, so 18.06 in our calculator, 18.06 divided by 1.34. And we'll take the square root of that. We get, um, excuse me, 18.06, get 1.34. Now we can calculate our T value. T is equal to 55.5, and we calculated that before um, in the previous process, minus 50 divided by our estimated standard error of 1.34. So in our calculators, we've got 55.5 minus 50 divided by 1.34, and we get a T statistic equal to 4.10. Again, in relation to our um, critical t values 
we find that it is in the critical region, right? We know we get to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and we've got a couple more steps to do on the next um, page. We're going to be asked to calculate D and draw our final conclusion. So let's do that. So we're asked to calculate our D. Our D is calculated by taking our mean difference and dividing by our um, S. And interesting thing that we we'll need to do is calculate our standard deviation um, because we only stopped at our variance. So if we want our standard deviation, we'll have to take the square root of our variance. Variance was 18.06. So in our calculators, if we take 18.06 and take the square root, um, we get 4.25 if we round, 4.25. And so our D then becomes 55.5 minus 50 divided by 4.25. So if we take um, 55.5 minus 50 divided by 4.25, we get 1.29, and that's a very high, high effect. Again, anything above 0.8 is considered very high. So we're just expressing the mean difference between the sample mean and the population mean in standard deviation units. So this is 1.29 standard deviation unit difference between the two. And now we can write our concluding statement. So we get to reject the null results indicate that children that um, go to child care perform differently on the standardized math assessment or math test. So again, results indicate that children that go to child care perform differently on the standardized math test. We conducted a t-test with degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom were equal to nine. We had 10 children participate in the, in the experiment or test. Our T statistic was equal to 4.10, 4.10, and our probability statement um, indicates that the probability of obtaining that T statistic is less than 1%, less than alpha, which is very good, and D is equal to 1.29, illustrating very high effect, and we're done.